I do believe that one can be an atheist and still pray mm -hmm. um, or agnostic and still pray. But uh, for me, it really came about through understanding that there are certain aspects of myself that I just couldn't resolve on my own. If I just let go of my obsessive rationalistic mind or whatever problem solving mind, scientific approach to everything, I can open because if we don't let go or if we don't acknowledge that we don't have all the answers or can't figure it out, there's no space for God or prayer or what we're asking for to come in. Hello, everybody. My Hello. name is Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Dave. Is your I'm, name Dave? My name is Dave. <laughs> okay, yeah. hi. So we are gathered here this morning to review the Andrew Huberman, Lex Friedman discussion, in particular, the clip around Huberman on prayer and faith in God. And as he, as I think about this, it's quite interesting because he's a neuroscientist mm. and a hyper rational atheistic type of person, at least from his conversations publicly on his podcast. Mm. And it might be interesting to listen to somebody like that talk about God or prayer. Are you religious, Mike? No, I, this silly saying of I'm spiritual, not religious, which is commonly mentioned a lot these days. I do have a spiritual practice, which could mirror a religion perhaps, but I don't think I have any particular beliefs in the supernatural or mm. things that I can't experience or mm. I hesitate to say see with my own eyes. Mm. What about yourself? I don't know. I, I don't, uh, I haven't thought, I actually don't, I haven't thought a lot about it. Um, I like to think I'm spiritual, but I don't I actually don't know what that means. I'm not sure what it means for me to be spiritual. So hopefully this discussion will help me learn more about that. Organized religion, maybe I've never been drawn to, but I do think it's important for like morals and community. And I think the decline of religion in some sense is probably not a good thing for society. Um, but then the excesses of religion aren't a good thing either. So I'm not sure where I stand. Like in, in terms of my own personal practice, I don't pray. I'm not a huge meditator. I, I probably should be more. Um, sometimes I think in terms of karma, if that's mm -hmm. a spiritual thing, I'm like, Okay, if I let this person in, if I hold this door open for this person, maybe something good will happen to me in the future. So maybe that's the extent of my spiritual practice. Um, but maybe it's something I should explore. So I'm looking forward to seeing where this conversation goes. Okay. I do think for people watching or listening, mm. this idea of the, I know you could say the the reduction in religious practice or what is it like consistency or habits in Western culture is a problem. Clearly we do have a God shaped, God shaped hole in our psych collective psyches. And if we take some of the cultural narrative going on, that's often what people say uh, because of that lack of religious community practice, people tend to go to certain political ideologies or social beliefs so just for yourself, if you notice that happening, you know, what is it that you are filling the God-shaped hole with? Mm. And God can mean many different things for many different people. What are you filling your meaning, purpose, connection to the nature of reality with? Good question. Should we go? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's hear what Andrew Huberman has to say about yeah. that. I have a morning meditation that I do. Um, well, I wake up now, I get my sunlight, I hydrate, I use the bathroom, I do all the, the things that I talk about. Um, I've, I've started a practice of prayer in the last year, which is new-ish for me, which is, we could talk about in it. In the morning? Want. Yeah. Can you talk about it a little bit? Sure, yeah. And, I, and then I have a, a meditation that I do that actually is where I think through with the different roles that I play. Mm -hmm. So I, like I start very basic. Um, I say, you know, okay, I'm an animal, like we are, we are like, biologically animals, right? Mm -hmm. Human, you know, I'm a man, I'm a scientist, I'm a teacher, I'm a friend, I'm a brother, I'm a son. You know, I go through this, I have this list and I think about the different roles that I have and the roles that I still want in my life going forward mm -hmm. that I haven't yet fulfilled. It just takes me, it, it's sort of an inventory of where I've been, where I'm at and where I'm going, as they say. Um, and I don't know why I do it, but I started doing it this last year, I think because um, it helps me understand just how many different uh, contexts I have to exist in and, and, and remind myself 
that there's still more that I haven't done that I'm excited about. So within each of those contexts, there's like things that you want to kind of accomplish to define that. Yeah. And I'm ambitious. So I think, you know, I'm a brother. I have, I have an older sister and I love her tremendously. And I think like, I want to be the best brother I can be to her, which means maybe a call, maybe just, um, you know, we do an annual trip together for our birthdays. Our birthdays are close together. We always go to New York for our birthdays that we've gone for the last three, four years. Like really like reminding myself of that role, not because I'll forget, but because I have all these other roles I'll get pulled into. Mm -hmm. I say the first one, I'm an animal <laughs> because I have to remember that I have a body that needs care. Like any of us, I need sleep. I need food. I need hydration. I need that I'm human, that that the brain of a human is, is marvelously complex, but also um, marvelously... Uh, self-defeating at times. And I, so I've been thinking about these things in the context of the different roles. And the, the whole thing takes about four or five minutes. And I just find it brings me a certain amount of clarity that then allows me to ratchet into the day. The prayer piece, um, yeah, I'm a, I, I think I've been reluctant to talk about. Maybe we should just pause there before, because he's about to talk about prayer after the meditation piece. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of things that I thought we could talk about. Anything came, come up for you there? Yeah, I wrote a bunch of notes. I was interested in his morning routine. I'm always interested in what some of these guys do who know things. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like what's yeah, his like yeah. what does he do when he wake up when he wakes up? So he mentioned like, you know, goes outside, ice bath, hydration, meditation, all those things that are now more commonly known. He spoke Huberman has spoke about them at length. In the past. In the past. Yeah, and there's um, lots of good YouTube content on and Huberman's morning routine. I guess the only thing I'd say, and, and we, we should move on to the, the, yeah. the question of prayer and, and, and faith in God. Um, I actually think mornings are so crucial for me, at least um, they're so critical for how the rest of the day unfolds. Like what you do upon waking up, I think has big consequences. Um, you can really sort of put yourself on the wrong path. Mm. I think with some, some, I guess, quote unquote, lazy choices in the morning. Um, and then you can really put yourself on the right path with sort of the right regime. Yeah. Um, do you find, so for me, mornings are a big deal. Like I've, I don't always do what I need to do, but if I do date, life is a bit easier, I feel better, more energetic, better dad, better partner son, friend, all those things, better teacher, all those. Do you find the same? Do you find mornings to be really, they have a big effect on your day? I would say I'm not great at that. I would say certainly they do have an effect on my day. Hmm. I would say due to my life circumstance and in terms of being a recovering addict and all those things over the past 10 plus years, I've as I heal and recover in sobriety, my morning routine has changed. Although for me, I'm very groggy in the morning. When I, I have practiced Andrew Huberman's morning routine stuff, and I encourage anyone to Google it quickly or YouTube it, you'll find lots of good information there. It is actually quite helpful. Mm. I've never been that good at routine. Uh, partly my ADHD, partly drug addiction, and partly certainly my personality. Mm. Although I do find when I am in a good routine, certainly it helps a lot. One thing I learned recently, I was just listening to Rich Roll's book. He said, which really was helpful for me to a little bit of shot in my ego or my denial was his morning routine starts the night before. And that's where I'm not, that's where I have a lot of work to do. Right. I, I, again, part, to my life circumstance and my history. I never wanted to go to bed. I went to bed in a drug induced coma for 15 years straight, literally. So I got some work to do there. I could probably, yeah, I think even talking about it out loud right now, I got some work to do there. Certainly. The other piece, just to comment on what he said is he said, he starts with being an animal first. And that's this idea of starts with me. We can't fulfill our other roles uh, we can if we want to fulfill our other roles as best we can we need to remember we have to keep the primary focus on ourselves our health our sanity what we're doing so that we can fulfill those other roles it's the i, I think 100 percent um if you're not selfish in the right ways you can't be selfless in the right ways yeah right and and 
just to be picky it's not selfish well it it's not it it is I, the only thing, it is selfish but not in a ne- like we sort of ident- you know we define selfishness as a bad thing don't be right. selfish yeah, yeah, yeah. tell our kids don't be selfish in fact you have to be you have to care for yourself selfish defined neutrally as caring for yourself and doing the things that you need in your life yeah is absolutely necessary yes. to then provide and do things for other people so maybe that morning or the night before as you said it was a great point morning routines can't be done if your night routine is a disaster <laughs> yeah. right you can't yeah um <laughs> so yeah i think i lost my train of thought here a bit but it was around selfishness and should we go back to the video yep let's do All it right, let's go back to talk about um until now um because i don't believe in pushing religion on people. And, um, and I think that, um, and I'm not, um, it's a highly individual thing. And I do believe that one can be an atheist and still pray, mm. um, or agnostic and still pray. But, uh, for me, it really came about through understanding that there are certain aspects of myself that I just couldn't resolve on my own. And no matter how much therapy, no matter how much, and I haven't done a lot of it, but no matter how much plant medicine or other sorts of medicine or exercise or um, podcasting or science or friendship or any of that, I was just not going to resolve. And so um, I started this because uh, someone close to me um, said, uh, a male friend said, you know, prayer is powerful. And I said, well, how? And I said, I don't know how, but if you, th- if you can get, it can allow you to get outside yourself, get, let you give up control and at the same time, take control. I don't even like saying take control, but the, the whole notion is that, and again, forgive me, but there's no other way to say it. The whole notion is that, you know, like God works through us, whatever God is to you, he, he, him, her, whatever, uh, life force, life, nature, whatever it is to you, right? That it works through us. And so I do a prayer, I'll just describe it, where I, I ask, um, I, I make an ask uh, to help remove my defects, my character defects. I, I pray to God to help remove my character defects so that I can show up um, better in all the roles of my life and do good work, like to, which for me is learning and teaching. I got to pause it there for a second. He's describing AA, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe his good friend is Rich Roll. I don't know. Rich Roll is a big AA person. That's a step seven prayer mm. is asking God to help remove our defects of character so that we can be of service to the world. And there's also a step one element, except there's a higher yeah, power. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, step one is except we have a no problem. problem. What yeah, step yeah. two is except there's a higher power? came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And step three, which is a bit aligned, is turned our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God, praying only for the knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. Okay. So that's what he's describing here. Is this just idea, and we talked a little bit about it in the Sam Harris video, which Mm -hmm. you can watch here, if we have the (laughs) technical capacity to put up one of those YouTube cards. Hmm. I love that he's talking about this. Wow, mm-hmm. isn't that amazing? So mm-hmm. therapy, psychedelics, exercise, science, et cetera, et cetera. He went through all those things that were not resolving this part of his life. Mm-hmm. And that's what this idea of a higher power is. And I love he also said you, you could be ag- agnostic and atheist and still pray. Beautiful, beautiful. So I, I guess yeah. what I would be curious about, and I want, if he was here, yeah. Um, and I wonder if he says it, we'll, we'll press play in a second. What would, what were those character defects? problems he couldn't address, right? right like what right. were they? Was it just like just general frustration with life despite all of his successes and, you know, the beautiful connections he has with his family and friends and colleagues? Was it just like this, you know, this feeling of hmm. lack of fulfillment? Mm-hmm. Like you wonder what, mm-hmm. what, what thing, what hole he was trying to fill with religion. Um, I'm not sure if he'll get into that. It's probably maybe highly personal. He doesn't have to share that. He may. Should we play? Uh, yeah, see what let's he says. play it. Let's see. All right. And so you might say, well, how is that different than a meditation? Well, hmm. it, I'm acknowledging that there is something that bigger than me 
bigger than nature, as I understand it, that I cannot understand or control, nor do I want to. And I'm just giving over to that. Mm -hmm. And does that make me less of a scientist? I, I sure as hell hope not. I certainly know <laughs> I, there's the head of our neurosciences at Stanford until recently. Um, I, you should talk to him directly about it. Bill Newsom has talked about his religious life. Um, for me, it's really a way of getting outside myself and then understanding how I fit into this bigger picture. And it's, and the character defects part is real, right? I'm a human, I have defects like, <laughs> I got a lot of flaws in me like anybody, but, um, and trying to acknowledge them and asking for help in removing them, not magically, but through right action, through my right action. Okay, I can't, again, that is AA. Or, or yep. AA clearly provides people exactly what he's talking about. And the words he's using and the referencing very much is AA. I, I'm even, I'm a little bit compelled right now to bring up the step seven prayer, but maybe I won't. Should I bring it up or um, maybe it's not necessary, but go on. Cause you, you had a few thoughts about what he was saying, I think. Um, on the so there's maybe two things one i want to talk I, i'm sort of curious about what his character defects are because right. i think this is useful for figuring out what am, what are we struggling those in those listening you and i mike um what tools are appropriate for like what problems do we have and what are some tools out there that can help us great so actually uh, can yeah. i interrupt yeah. yeah yeah um in order to figure out our character defects yeah if we follow the step model, we need to do a step four and five. So we can't Sorry, ask four or five of AA. Of the yeah, AA. Okay. yeah, because that is a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Right. Then we start to see what our defects are. Some are clear, others are not. For example, I was just sharing on Thursday about this at my group. We did step seven. And I always give this example of early in my recovery, I was doing the dishes and I was stewing about my wife, something that I was resentful to her for. And that's when it dawned on me, oh, this is when I'm supposed to ask God to help me let go of this resentment mm. or this character defect. And the character defect for me was wanting to always be right. Moral superiority. I'm right. She is wrong. My behavior is moral, hers is immoral. And then I also had this moment of recognizing that I'm actually not ready to let it go. Mm. That's a big part. And that's what prayer helps us navigate. So step six is became willing to have these defects removed. So at that point, step six and seven are often described as the same. Mm -hmm. So step six is became willing. Step seven is asked God to remove them. Interesting. And so I wasn't willing at that time to let go of my resentment to my wife oh, or, or I wasn't willing to let go that I thought I was, and I was clearly aware of this. And so there's also a part of us, and this might be selfishness, self-centeredness, or something egoic, egoic. It feels good to think or feel that I'm right and someone else is wrong. And that's what I wasn't ready to let go of. Because I wasn't in connection with God or, or mindfulness or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So what you just said is, I think, interesting. Um, it feels good to think that we're right and we're wrong. It, But it, we know it doesn't, right? Like, I know you know it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we don't want to sit in this feeling of moral superiority because we walk around resentful, pit, easily triggered. Um, Without the awareness, though, we do. Yes. Yeah. So I wonder, just going back to Huberman yeah. for a second, like, why would he need religion? So this is the question. He's got all these tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why does he need religion? Wow. And so, Such a good question. And it sounds like probably what he's, what he was well, struggling Well, let's with. just say he doesn't need religion. Prayer. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Right. Religion. Whatever, yeah. Whatever yeah. client broadly yeah. defines. Yeah. yeah. Not in the, you know, a organized traditional yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, he probably, I wonder if he needed it because, I don't know how to articulate it, but he seemed to be like, I need to get over myself. Maybe, maybe being a leading neuroscientist at one of the best universities in the world does crazy things with the mind and not positive things. Maybe the ego got out of control. And this is not a personal thing. No, no, for to sure. Professor yeah. Huberman. But yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that could happen to anyone. I see it in academia, the sense of people know so much. They're so smart. 
They have all this access to information and that can sort of play tricks on our, on our minds. Thinking we control more than we control, thinking we're, that we're better than we actually are. Um, and maybe he came to the realization that he needs to get out of his mind a bit and surrender to the uncertainty of reality, surrender to his weaknesses and not say, well, I'm this leading scientist. I know everything. I am therefore better. Um, and, you know, bring in all the, the associated frustrations and negative emotions that would come with that attitude. Yes. So I wonder if religion helped him take the edge off. Yeah. Um, and to that point of yeah. surrender. So he also mentioned, this is in my email. This is what my sponsor pounded into my head. You can't think your way out of right action. You can't think your way into right action. You have to act your way into right thinking. So here he's describing all, as you're saying, mm. all this brilliance and all these tools and information and still it's not enough. enough. And that's where that idea of do less and accomplish more. Mm. It's sort of, can I let go of all this? We also live in a world that promotes this way of thinking. So we need to learn to let go of what we think is right and act our way into right thinking. And the action that he's describing is a prayer, is to, is to pray for these things. That's the action. And, it, and, it's, and I'm wondering um, what we're trying, with religion and prayer, again, broadly defined, what are we trying to get let go of? Is it we're trying to let go of the sense that everyone's wrong and we're right and we're being aggrieved? I, is it mm, what do we like what mm, would you say mm, when you mm, engage in, in some of these stuff like you're trying to let go of ego you're trying to let go of moral superiority you're trying to let go of maybe hating yourself a bit feeling like you're not good enough what do we like what right, would you say right, you're trying right, to let yeah, go of yeah. i th i think primarily it's the ego or the self-will we also talked about that a bit in the self sam harris video yeah it's this idea that i am right or i should be able to think my way out of this problem. It's that sort of narrow, right? I have the answer. I will seek the answer through my rational we trained mind. Yeah. Something like that. Right. Yeah. And, and we're just, and that's right. Mike, that's yeah, ego. Right? Is that ego? Is it that could it? be. So some people would say, yes, that's the ego okay. or the self will. Right. Right. Or the, the, uh, in the Jungian shadow work stuff, as I understand it, that's the ego sort of laying claim to the shadow or, or trying to control the shadow by pushing away the parts of ourselves that we don't want to face or acknowledge. Mm, okay. Interesting. And that's the shadow, the, the characteristics of us that we've suppressed due to their non-acceptance in society or to ourselves right okay and that's part of what prayer does or or an inventory process of seeking out your character defects mm -hmm. and another person who talks about this who just a little shameless promotion anna lemke who's going to be on the podcast soon she in her book talks about how when she was doing her residency in medical school one of her her supervisor took her through the steps which is amazing, right? Sorry, the 12th. Yeah, a, and she talked about how helpful that was in her life. Right. Yeah. Because you have to dig into the shadow and all these parts of ourselves that we've suppressed. Interesting. Yeah. So religion is this tool. Well, so I, I yeah, yeah, sorry. Just to separate the yeah. religion, because most people will have that relationship right. to like it. Going to church. Yeah, or yeah. Or, or Judeo-Christian, right? Right. Or, or whatever religion. When we're referencing that now, I, as I understand, it's more the practices of spirituality or, right. or what it means, what is a religious quote unquote life. And as Huberman said, we could have that minus the religious nature with all right? this stuff or the traditional it. religions. Right. right. Interesting. Okay. Should we keep going? Yeah. So I do that every morning. And um, I have to say that it's helped. It's helped a lot. It's helped me be better to myself, be better to other people. Mm. Um, I still make mistakes, um, but it's a it's becoming a bigger bigger part of my life. And I never thought I'd talk like this, mm -hmm. um, but I think um, it, it's clear to me that if we don't believe in something, again, doesn't have to be traditional standardized religion but if we don't believe in something bigger than ourselves we uh at some level will self-destruct 
I really, I really think so. It's power and it's powerful in a way that all the other stuff, meditation, all the tools is, is not because it's really operating at a, at a much deeper and bigger level. And, um, hmm. you know, if, yeah, I think that, I think that's all I, I can talk about it. Um, mostly because I'm still working out, uh, the, you know, the scientist in me wants to understand how it works and yeah. I want to understand. <laughs> and the point is to just go, you know, there's some, there's, you know, hmm for lack of a better language for it, there's higher power than me and what I can control. I'm giving up control mm. on certain things. And somehow that restores a sense of agency for for right action, better action. That, sorry, Mike, that, that's interesting. Beautiful, yeah. So I wonder if he, I wonder if he would say, yeah, the big thing I struggled with was a s inflated sense of self. Yeah, yeah. Right, that yeah, I was yeah. the center of this, of this universe and, I needed to give myself over to something bigger than me and surrender control over what happens, what I experienced, what I thought, my mistakes, and just say, I can't control everything. Um, I can't know everything. I can't explain everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he um, mentioned briefly, yeah. the scientist in me wants to know why it works and why, how yeah, it works. Why, and, why, and why, just, why, why, yeah. I, perhaps that's what he's, you know, when we say, uh, admitted we were powerless. Like in this sense, that's an example. I don't want to put words in his mouth, obviously, but having been immersed in this language long enough, it seems like some part of him is is surrendering his intelligence or his his rationalistic scientific mind to just letting go. Like, it's okay not to have all the details and the answers. What's interesting here is there's religion and science are always like pitted against one another. Right. Like if you're a scientist, you can't be religious. Right, and if you're, right, relig right. you're religious, you can't be a scientist or whatever, which is clearly like often not the case. I think Huberman's mentor, who was the chair, that, like the, yeah. the professor he mentioned, he was the chair of the neuroscience department at Stanford, I think, I think was his PhD supervisor or something like that. So, or they work closely together and he's a religious person. Um, but what's so interesting is religion is all about accepting the un uncertainty in life and that we can't control everything and we're, we ourselves are not this higher power something else is um and if you look at any solid definition of science despite how science the word was used during the recent pandemic often by public health officials a key characteristic of science is uncertainty we don't know if you read any scientific paper often at the end it says we probably need to explore further research is needed on you know x right, y and z right, right. Um, good our methods. papers, good papers. Yeah, good, yeah. Yes, yeah. There's, <laughs> scientists don't speak in terms of like large T truths right, all the time. Right, right, right. Uh, they think in terms of here's this small probabilistic claim that we're making about some complicated problem. Here's our data. Here are our methods. They're flawed for these, you know, four or five reasons, but we think they're so reliable as an indicator of real knowledge. Um, but scientists are still operating with a huge degree of uncertainty, especially on, on complicated problems. So the uncertainty thing, I wonder what Huberman would say to that, but it's sort of like connected. There's lots of things he doesn't know that's consistent with a scientific perspective of the world. Um, uncertainty is inherent to our, our understanding because our brains are powerful but limited. And religion is about giving over yourself to surrendering some control, which I think is also an acknowledgement of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Um, that we can't do everything, we can't know everything, we can't explain everything. So I think that connection is actually an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. And and I've heard recently, I've probably heard it many times, but it's stuck with me more recently is science and religion actually do have the same aim to, hmm. to seek the truth, right? Or to find out what's true or what's real. I'm, I'm, I don't, I think, so science, yeah, properly done, yeah. I'm not sure religion, I'm not sure religion would say, I think religion is more about I think I don't know is more about living what would be considered a mortal life. Yeah. Even if it's wrong. Like let's say God doesn't exist, but a God this God this fictional God figure helps me be a better person to the homeless. Yeah. And to my you know to anyone, then that's then I'm fine with that. But we But a scientist might say, "Well, that thing doesn't exist, therefore you shouldn't look to it for moral insight." No no doubt, but isn't there not the implicit assumption that it's right to act this way but, but it, yes but it's right to act a way act a certain way but it's not in pursuit of 
truth right. okay. about how yeah, things yeah. actually work. Right. Because right. sometimes right. scientific knowledge can lead to some really dark findings about human existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that religion and other ideologies say, let's push that aside because that would tear apart society. Do, okay, okay. I've, I've been reading recently around that the good and evil, right? The devil and the whatever in us. Mm -hmm. There's some claims that say, yeah, and I'm probably not quoting this perfectly, but there is the pushing away of the evil kind mm -hmm. of idea to not mm -hmm. fully articulate or acknowledge that we have good and evil within mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. I think wisdom is the acknowledgement that we are good. We talked about this in the last video too. Yeah. We are good and bad. Yeah. And we need to integrate in order to act in a way that's more helpful. Maybe I would say, um, maybe the, just going back to your, your initial point about both science and religion okay. seeking yeah, explanations. Yeah. yeah. I think probably the origins of, of religion in the same way that the origins of sort of like modern day scientific methods was probably about explaining things. So like, how do we explain, yeah, yeah. you know, 5,000 years ago, how do we explain lightning? How do we explain earthquake? How do we explain famine? How do we explain the death of a child? Oh, the gods were unhappy. It was like a hypothesis <laughs> right. and then a, a thing that people started to believe in, mm -hmm. whether they're right or wrong, I'm not gonna, I don't know. Um, but yes, I think it would be, it was part of the human, maybe the human attempt to try to make sense of their world of, of, of our world and to give us guidance about how we ought to be behaving. Mm -hmm. So religion in, in one sense was maybe an, an explanatory device. Like how do we make sense of all these crazy things that are happening around us? And also a bit of a moral code. Like how do I, how, ought, how, sh how should I treat this person? How should I treat this stranger? How should I treat this, um, this prisoner of war? How should I fight a war? Like religion says, you know, all the major religions said things about that. So it was maybe explanatory seeking truth in one sense, and also providing a moral code, giving us a sense of how can we keep societies cohesive and peaceful and stable uh, under uncertain conditions. Yeah. That's good stuff. Let's go back to the video. I think perhaps a part of that is uh, just the humility that comes with acknowledging there's something bigger and more powerful than you. And you can't control everything. Yeah. It's, I mean, that you, Go through life as a hard driving person, you know, forward center of mass. I remember being that way since I was little. Mm. It's like a new Legos. I'm like, I'm gonna be all the Legos. I was like on the weekends, you know, learning about medieval weapons and then giving lectures about it in class when I was five or six years old. We're learning about tropical fish and, you know, cataloging all of them at the store and then organizing it and making my, you know, my dad drive me or my mom drive me to some fish store and then spending all my time there until they throw me out, you know, all of that. But I also remember my entire life I would secretly pray when things were good and things weren't good, but mostly when things were, weren't good because mm -hmm. it's important to pray. For me, it's important to pray each morning regardless. But when things weren't right, I couldn't get, make sense of them, I would secretly pray, but I felt kind of ashamed of that mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And then it was once in college, I distinctly remember I, I was having a hard time with a number of things um, and I took a run down to Sands Beach, it was UC Santa Barbara. And I remember I just, I was like, I don't know if I even have the right to, to do this, but I'm just praying. I just prayed for uh, the ability to be as brutally honest with myself and with other people as I possibly could be about a particular situation I was in at that time. Mm. I mean, I, I think now it's probably safe to say I'd, I'd gone off to college because of a high school girlfriend. We had, we, essentially she was my family, more frankly, more than my biological family was at, at a certain stage of life. And we'd reached a point where we were diverging and it was, it was incredibly painful. It was like losing everything I had. And it was like, what do I do? How do I manage this? Do I, you know, I was ready to quit and join the fire service just to support us so that we could move forward. And, and, um, and, you know, it was just, but praying, just go, saying, I can't figure this out on my own. It's sort of like, I can't figure this out on my own. And how frustrating that is. And no number of friends could tell me or and inner wisdom couldn't tell me. And eventually it led me to, to the right answers. And she and I are, are friendly friends to this day. She's happily married with a child and um, we're on good terms. But I think, you know, it's it's a it's a scary thing, but it's the best thing when you I, I can't control all this. And asking for help. I think is also the piece. You're not asking for some magic hand to come down and take care of it. You're asking for the help to come through you, right? So that your body is used to do these right works, right action.
Isn't it interesting that this secret thing that you're almost embarrassed by that you did it as a child is something you, oh, man. it's another thing you do as you get older, is you realize like those things are part of you and it's actually a beautiful thing. Yeah. A lot of the content of the podcast is, you know, deep academic content and we talk about everything from, you know, uh, eating disorders to bipolar disorder to depression, you know, a lot of different topics, but the tools are the protocols, as we say, right? The sunlight viewing, all the rest. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff is just stuff I wish I had known when I was in graduate school. If I'd known to go outside every once in a while and get some sunlight, mm. not just stay in the lab, I would have, you know, I might not have hit a, like a really tough round of depression when I was a postdoc and working twice as hard. And, you know, when my body would break down or I'd get sick a lot, I don't get sick much anymore. Occasionally, about once every 18 months to two years, I get a, you know, I'll get something. But, um, Learn, you know, I used to break my foot skateboarding all the time. I couldn't understand what's wrong with my body. I'm getting injured. I can't do what everyone else can. Now I developed more slowly at a long arc of puberty. Um, but I, so that was part of it. I was still developing, but you know, how to get your body stronger, how to build endurance. Like, no one told me the information wasn't there. So a lot of what I put out there is the information that I wish I had had, because once I had it, I was like, wow, like A, this stuff really works. B, it's grounded in something real. You know, some place, sometimes certain protocols are a combination of, you know, animal, human, and animal and human studies, sometimes clinical trials, sometimes there's some mechanistic uh, conjecture for some, not all, I always make clear which, but in the end, like figuring out how things work so that we can be happier, healthier, more productive, suffer less, like reduce the suffering of the world. Um, and uh, I think that, well, I'll just say, Thank you and um and for asking about the prayer piece. Um again, I'm not pushing or even encouraging it on anyone. I've just found it to be tremendously useful for me. Oh wow. Okay. Um so it's it, clearly I, I hate to make this into like a bit of a like an, like an analysis of Huberman's psyche. But he, clearly he's struggling with actually the role relig religion and prayer ought to play in his life. Because if you actually listen to what he just said over the last two minutes, he just provided a solid defense, not for religion, but for knowledge accumulation and the scientific rigorous study of, you know, disease and habits and practices that can actually help address some of those diseases. Yeah. So... And then he goes back and ends, okay, but religion has been very, very important. And he thought he, he might have thought he was actually prayer, talking about prayer. religion. Yeah, prayer. But he was actually talking about the science side of his, the knowledge accumulation side of things. Um so it's interesting. I think I, I so it, it's it's cool how both can actually coexist. Mm -hmm. And I love how honest he is. And it it, yeah, it, it, it sounds like he hasn't fully made up his mind about, or maybe maybe just this was like a short clip and there's a longer discussion or or elsewhere. And this is not a criticism, hmm. but it's, I think he's probably in some ways struggling with not being able to explain what role of prayer ought to play, what it's doing for to him, uh, or if it is having positive effects, why it's having those positive effects. So it, it sounds like there's a tiny bit of tension, just in my little interpretation of what he just said. But I love how he's talking about things in such a genuine, authentic way that someone who has so many things, at least you know i don't know him personally at all yeah he seems like just an awesome dude with a lot with a great career and brilliant brain why would he be unhappy with anything and he's like out of any of us struggling in trying to make sense of his existence and pulling out every tool possible um which i find admirable and he says you know the importance of like being humble seeking help doing things that make you feel empowered man that's that stuff is like you just got to remind yourself of all those things like that's yeah. so just be humble know that you're flawed and just try your best to get over whatever you're trying to get over ask people for assistance whether that's right. in a, some god or an a group or an undergrad advisor or a prof or a therapist whatever and do what it takes to fill your bucket so you can wake up in the morning saying all right let's go let's go to work and get get the stuff done that i need to get done yeah. um and whether that's through religion or something else so that was, a, I don't know, I'm all, I'm all motivated. I'm all pumped up right now. It may yeah. not seem like it, but I feel like in, <laughs> inside, I'm like, that's, I would love to remind myself to be all those things, humble, empowered, and ask for help when you need it. There's no shame in that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe to respond specifically to the tension that you're reflecting on mm -hmm. with him between the knowledge, information, guidance, and 
we can't figure everything out or at least surrendering mm-hmm. to not needing to figure everything out, which I agree. He, he is a really genuine guy. And I love when he shares personal things like this. He does sometimes on his own podcast, but mm-hmm. not as much as he tends to when he's talking with other people, which makes sense. Going back, they also mentioned, you mentioned it to humility. So mm. the reason I think I keep referencing the steps is because I do think the 12 step model is a great model for agnostics and atheists to integrate religious practices or spiritual practices into their lives. There's so much wisdom there. And so what they're saying, so again, step six, the principle behind step six is willingness. Mm -hmm. And the principle behind step seven is humility, Mm. which Lex brought up there. So the humility to realize that we don't have all the answers, Mm. right? If I just let go of my obsessive rationalistic mind, or whatever problem solving mind, scientific approach to everything, I can open because if we don't let go or if we don't acknowledge that we don't have all the answers or can't figure it out, there's no space for God or prayer or what we're asking for to come in. So we have to be willing. I mentioned that earlier with the thing with my wife. If I'm not willing to let go or if I'm not willing to ask for help, which another thing they pointed out, which was great asking for help. If I'm not willing to do that, then then I need to figure out how to get some more willingness. Mm-hmm. Maybe I can pray for some willingness. Then I can have the humility to wait for the answers to come, perhaps, right? Or, or through the, Huberman said, God works through us, right? Mm-hmm. The prayer, the higher power stuff, it works through us. But if we're closed with our egoic, you know, I have all the answers or I'll figure it out scientifically, whatever, then there's no space for, for the higher power, for the prayer to work through us. And there's lots of talk around psychotherapy, spiritual practices, mindfulness, how the huge limitation of the scientific method is that it can't quantify a lot of this stuff Mm. and it can't put a finger on it. And maybe we'll get there, which would be cool. Although right now we have to have some faith or belief and that only comes through action, next right action. He's using all the AA terms here. It's an experiential process. Mm -hmm. And we learn through the experience of doing the next right thing or taking the actions of prayer, letting go, humility. And it's a practice, right? He said every morning he's trying to do this. So it's not just something you think, it's Mm -hmm. something that you You, do. You do. Yeah. The the other thing, um, it sounds like what's going on is um, prayer religion for Huberman and for other people. And and I think Mike, this is consistent with what you you were just saying. It's like a way for us to calm down. Mm -hmm. Like I I sort of say like, why, why should we like loosen? Why should we like tighten our grip? Why should we not seek knowledge? Why should we always, why should we not try to control things? You know, I would love to be able to control more, you know what I mean? I I wouldn't, but in some ways I would love to figure out exactly what's going to happen for the rest of my day, where my career is going, what's going to happen to my daughter and my, you know, my wife and my family and all that stuff. Um, But like maybe the, the unintended consequences of, of, of like this excessive pursuit of knowledge and control is it makes us like, you know, the, our, our fists are clenched all the time. And I wondered if if Huberman struggled with that. He mm. he might have been like, I'm just constantly studying and researching and seeking data and questioning. And I had this in me too. Like, you know, I'm not I'm not an uncalm person, but I wouldn't say I'm like calm. Like I think there's a fire inside me that maybe I'd like to tone down a tiny mm. bit sometimes. Um, and I think maybe religion and prayer is a way to turn that to dial the you know turn the dial back a tiny bit. And take the edge off and to say, eh, all this stuff, I, I don't know why that's happening. I guess that, you know, that thing just happened. Like the clouds just passed. Like I remember, I know in, in some meditation practices, just like view things as like, you know, passing clouds. Can't control where they're going. You can't come, you can't control when they're coming in. You can't, like, you can't control your thoughts. Just let them pass, shrug your shoulders a tiny bit, see them, observe them, but don't give them too much weight. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe this whole thing is about a bit about just calming down. Just, you know. Letting a go. Bit, slowing down, slowing down and saying, yeah, there's not, a, I can't, I can't know everything. I can't control everything. I can't predict everything. 
Um, I can't always be right. Hmm. Um, I think those things are... So those can'ts are also good because often in the mental health space, we talk about, no, you can do all this stuff. You're great. But maybe you can't do certain things. You can't. No, you can't do X, Y, and Z. And you're better off for reminding yourself of those things. Like that's maybe the another thing. I'm not sure what you think of that. But, you know, often we talk about like positive reinforcement and, you know, encouraging people. But maybe we need to encourage ourselves and others to accept our, our, our human limitations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And to be cool with that and to be like, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Okay. I've rambled yeah. enough. No, that was great. Hmm. I think there's a part of letting go. That's the word hmm. that kept yeah. coming up. We, we yeah. can let go. And Huberman mentioned, we probably did too already. There is action in the non-doing, in the letting go. There's a great saying in mindfulness circles, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> right. So <laughs> This, city, this is a, sorry, don't city. just do something, sit there. Because we would often say, don't just sit there, do something, right? <laughs> it's but amazing. The, yeah, it is. So don't just do something, sit there. And that's this idea of sitting in the not knowing, sitting in the watching and the openness to things unfolding in their natural way. In right. the way without that, uh, I need to do something. I need to control this. I need to da 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 da. And, and that is a form of action. Non doing is yes. action. Yes. And if we talk about karma, you mentioned karma, I think maybe before we were talking or I can't remember. Mm. Karma is action, but non-doing is also a form of karmic action. Yeah. So instead of trying to fix everything, my new karma is, can I just sit here and let things be as they are? Right. And that has a physiological component to it. And that's also what we're trying to learn through these practices is what does it feel like in my body when I let go? Right. <sighs> it actually feels good. Just to, Just to let go. <sighs> hmm. Maybe everyone just take a good collective sigh if you're watching. <sighs> that's a form of letting go. Right. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Please comment, share, subscribe, do, subscribe, all that kind of good stuff. And maybe post uh, if you want us to talk about anything else, any questions, clarifications, yeah. please let us know. Thank you for watching. David, thank you. No, thank for you. For your wisdom. And, and to Lex Freeman and Andrew Huberman yes, for sharing yes, their, yes. their thought provoking content. Indeed. Okay, take it easy. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.